Glasto sat on the bench and fidgeted. He was jumping an inordinate number of layers of supervision by requesting this meeting, and knew he could be in significant trouble if this wasn't deemed to be worthy. He looked nervously at the large door that led to the office of the archivist, going over in his mind what he planned to say. The archivist was the head of the Galactic Research and Exploration Foundation, and was old. Very old. Even among the exceptionally long-lived Altir people, he was old. Nearly 60,000 years. Most Altrians would be proud to hit 50,000 years, but the archivist continued on, still hosting public debates of research data or announcements of new discoveries. He was immensely respected. Which is why Glasto, at barely 1,200 years, and a very junior deep space researcher second class was so nervous. His career, his standing with his people, his future, hinged on this. He was flipping this thought over and over in his mind when a chime sounded, and the large door ponderously swung open to allow him in. Getting to his feet, he straightened his pristine white uniform, stretched his head high on his long neck, in order to look confident, and strode in. All confidence was lost the moment he saw the wizened archivist slouch back in a large ornate chair, behind an imposing desk and surrounded by high shelves filled with artifacts and baubles from a thousand civilizations. The archivist reached forward with a hand, and beckoned Glasto forward to the single chair in front of his desk. So, young Glasto, to what do I owe the unique honour of having such a junior member of my staff request a personal audience? The archivist said, with a hint of a grin taking the edge off of the admonishment. Glasto hurried forward and sat down with as much solemnity as he could muster. Sir, I have returned from my appointed exploration mission with a report of something for which I found no prior instance in our archives. I would have stayed longer to gain more evidence and examples, but I had so much already, I believe I was in danger of being discovered. The archivist leaned forward. A reasonable cause of early return, but why see me? Surely your superiors would have been the more reasonable point of contact? Ordinarily, sir, yes. But what I found was so... Wondrous. I felt it had to go to you directly. I believe the data in my report will bear me out as I tell you what I found. Glasto then took out a data cube and placed it on the desk. The archivist reached for it, but not before Glasto took out a second data cube and placed it next to the first, followed by a third, then a fourth, then a fifth. The archivist gave an impish grin. Seeking to snow me with data, young Glasto? Glasto's eyes went white. No, sir, never. This is everything I was able to find and download and... Sir, may I begin at the beginning? The archivist waved him to continue, and settled into his chair. Well, sir, I was dispatched to a promising system 200 years ago. Observation showed many planets. Upon my arrival, I found a varied and rich system. A main sequence yellow star with eight major planets, a dozen or so minor planets, and one over 200 moons. Cataloguing them all took quite some time, but it was the third planet out from the star that showed true promise. Liquid water on 70% of its surface, and large vegetation visible from great distance. High altitude observation showed a sentient species, numbering around 1.3 billion across the planet. Physically, they aren't terribly interesting. They call themselves humans, and... The archivist interrupted him there, with a hint of anger in his voice. You know their name? You interacted with these people? You know that's forbidden. No, sir, I did not. How I came to find out so much about them is a part of this story. As I said, they aren't terribly interesting physically. Carbon-based, endothermic, bipedal, sexually dimorphic omnivores. Standard size for most sentient life in this galaxy, perhaps slightly longer lifespans than most, with an average nearing 80 years. At the time of my arrival, they were a tier-free civilization, using fires to create steam at high pressure to move vehicles and industry, wind-driven ships and beasts of burden still common. They had recently discovered electricity and were using it to communicate over long distances for the first time. The archivist nodded. We have seen this before on numerous worlds, and have then watched over thousands of years as our species finally reached for the stars. I sincerely hope this isn't what you brought me. Sir, it's so much more than that. They denote time based on the orbit of their planet around their star, and number those units based on a major event in one of their religions. The archivist laughed. How many religions do they have? Hundreds. Some believe in a single god, some believe in multiple gods, some believe in no god, some believe in combinations of all three. That got the archivist's attention. That sounds, at the very least, something very interesting for our xeno-sociologists. Variety in religion isn't unheard of, but what you describe sounds unique. Sir, that's quite literally a minor matter compared to what I saw happen over the next 200 years. I arrived in the year they denote at 1845. 100 years later, they had gone from sailing ships and steam power to supersonic flight, full electrification of all industry, 
enhancing the power of nuclear fission, including his weapons. The archivist stood shocked still at that, and some of the dark purple of his skin turned a lighter shade of lavender. You must be mistaken. No civilization advances that fast. It's not possible. This I know, sir. I poured over our archives to find any example of something similar, and the closest I can find are the Deshkatari, who completed a similar jump in 2,500 years, and they didn't stop there. Less than 20 years later, they put their first objects into orbit with vehicles powered by pyrotechnic fuels, and just a few years later, started to put themselves into orbit. Then they landed on their own moon. Then they put permanent habitats in orbit. They sent probes and rovers to the other planets in their system. They sent out probes that, well, still very much slower than light, have left their system and are headed into interstellar space. They developed computer systems that advanced on such a rapid pace, I was having difficulties writing about new developments. Then they started to network their computers and do so via radio waves, which is why my report is so enormous. I was able to access their network and download as much of it as I could. What you see before you is the sum total history and knowledge of the humans as they know it. This includes their own archaeological investigations of their own people. The archivist slumped in abject shock. This wasn't just unprecedented. This would turn galactic theory of evolution on its head. This is... Uh, I'm speechless. What you have discovered, if this is true, the implications are staggering. He suddenly stiffened. You said you feared being discovered? Yes, sir. About 20 years ago, they began pushing out into space in earnest again. They established more permanent habitats in orbit around their planet, which they call Earth. They established a permanent habitat on the moon. And the year before I left, they sent their first manned mission to their fourth planet of their system, which they call Mars. There were so many vehicles, with humans aboard or simply autonomous, that are risk being run into or detected by a system they call radar, which uses electromagnetic radiation to bounce signals off objects in order to determine their location. Glasto took a deep breath. And there's more. They aren't a people. They are many peoples. Thousands of unique cultures and subcultures exist there, despite them all being the same species. As a result, things like art, music, food, clothing, language are all highly varied and highly developed. But they share two major characteristics. Innovation and a desire to explore. In my estimation, based on modelling the computer of my ship did, they will discover FTL travel in the next 50 to 100 years, and I believe that estimation may be generous. My recommendation is to send a first contact team as soon as possible. Much of their literature covers the question of them being alone in the universe, whether or not other life is hostile, and how to approach it. Many of their governments, with zero evidence of other sentient races, already have their own first contact protocols. They want to be found. The archivist didn't move for a long moment. Glasto, you are right to bring this to me personally, and I'm hereby promoting you to research a first class effective immediately. Do you have copies of your report? Yes, sir. Several. Give them to my assistant staff. Have them start sending them around to the heads of... Seven Hells, every department. You may have just made the most significant discovery in galactic history, and if you'll permit me... As the archivist hove himself up out of his chair and towards a small cabinet set into the wall, join me in a celebratory drink of fine cab. The archivist poured a dark red liquid out of a decanter and into two cubical drinking glasses. Glasto took the pre-offered glass and held it in front of him. Sir, the humans have a ritual close to our Rome for such occasions. They call it a toast. So, here's to this momentous discovery and hope for a brighter future. Glasto then took a long but formal sip. The archivist laughed and drained his glass in one gulp. And to the gigantic research grants we are going to get from this.